So uh, again, you have these reports, and it's hard for people not to believe that that's not true. Yes. And that's the first, one of the first documentaries that people saw. They saw wow. Mark Curtis telling uh, about what happened at the store, and it did not happen the way he said it happened. Wow. Because he was not even there. Wasn't even at the store. But later, uh, for his credit, he did recant to Emmett Till's mother and said that he was saying what he heard other people say. Oh. So we, we were glad that that happened, you know. He yes, said, yeah. yes. My goodness, that's, re that, that's one of the uh, things that we talk about um, uh, under respect. We talk about elevating our understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, it is so important that we think above and beyond and not just accept things at face value or the first time you hear it or, mm -hmm. or just because you see it on television. Mm -hmm. So. It is great to hear firsthand some of the things that happened. Yeah, it make, you should question a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. after that, and I started reading what they say happened, yeah. it makes you question things yeah. that you hear people say. Yes. Regardless of how professional they are or whatever, you know, you question it. And not that you have doubt, but you need to do a little investigation. Yes. Yeah, to look into it, see if it really happened that way. That, that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. That mm -hmm. makes perfect sense. Well, let's continue with the story. So um, this whistling happened. You all left and went back to the house, uh, Mo's Wright's house. Is that well, right? well, we didn't. What we did, we, mm -hmm. we jumped in the car. Okay. And, of course, first we couldn't get going because someone lost a cigarette in the midst on the floor. Mm -hmm. And my uncle was trying to find the cigarette. <laughs> and uh, Emmett Till got, was very anxious at this time because, you know, everybody's, when everybody panicked, he got scared. Oh, you know, that's it. He realized he had done something wrong, and he wanted us to get moving, especially when uh, someone said that she was going to get a gun. Oh. And uh, so we were going down this gravel road. By now it's dusk, mm. and there's a car coming behind us, and dust is flying. It's a gravel road. Yeah. Dust is flying everywhere, and we sped up, jumped out of the car, ran through the cotton field, mm -hmm. and the car went right on by. Mm. So we regrouped at the edge of the road, and somewhere in the interim there, Emmett Till begged us not to tell my grandfather about what had happened. Oh. And so we didn't. But there was a girl, her name was Ruth, and Ruth said, look, I know those people, so this is not over. So you're oh. going to hear some more about this. I'm going to pause right here just for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back again. We're talking here with Wheeler Parker. Stay with us. You don't want to miss the next part of this story. We'll see you back shortly. show above and beyond we're here today with mr wheeler parker we left off talking about what happened in that field uh, once you all got out of the car let's pick the story up right there and tell us what happened then yeah uh we stopped and jumped out of the car and ran through the cotton field and the cotton bowls were, they were kind of not all open so they beat our legs and we were running over each other until fell somebody fell over him but mm. so the car went by so we said well there was nothing to that okay so we regrouped at the edge of the road Till begged us not to tell my grandfather, but there's a girl there named Ruth, and she said, look, I know those people, and this is not over. You're going to hear some more about this. Mm. And uh, they, because they had done things to other people, but, okay. uh, we didn't really take it to heart. You know, right. nothing's happening right now, right. and uh, so we, we didn't take it to heart, and we forgot about it. It's Wednesday evening. Okay. So Thursday happened. We didn't look for anything. Mm -hmm. Thursday came by. Nothing happened. Friday, of course, we definitely have forgotten about it now. Right. Saturday, and on Saturday, you know, down south, everybody go to town. Okay, you yeah. Know, if you work a half a day, you go into town. <laughs> everybody gather from all the country, uh, the cities and hamlets, and uh, meet up and talk. And so we had a good time up there in Greenwood, Mississippi. Okay. And then we got home. On the way home, uh, my uncle, Maurice, same age as I am, a little younger. Yeah. He ran over a dog. Mm. And uh, Emmett Till Emma Till started crying because... Mm. Uh, he loved animals, cats and dogs, and uh, like I said, he he's a very had a sensitive side. In spite of all this fun of and prankster type <laughs> ways, you know, you would think that he wouldn't have that, but he yeah. had a sensitive side of it. Okay. And uh, we got home about 12, 12 30 thereabout, mm -hmm. and uh, we went to bed. And about two thirty or so, I could hear someone talking to my grandfather, mm -hmm. and they talking about what happened at the store. And I remember them saying we for a fat boy from Chicago. Someone had told them where we lived mm. and that it was the, he was a kind of chunky kid. Okay. And, uh, and it was so dark, 
you could hear my thumb, but you couldn't see anything. You couldn't see anything. And I'm kind of bucking my ass, and I'm thinking. And this is about 2.30 in the morning. About 2.30 in the morning. It's mm-hmm. a, terrible way to be, uh, a terrible way to wake up. Yes, yeah. And not all, it's not a pleasant 2.30. To, to wake me woke up at 2.30 is stress enough in itself. Yes, it is. <laughs> and then someone talking about they looking for somebody from Chicago. Mm-hmm. And uh, my grandfather not knowing what room he was in is a former landlord's home. Big house, four bedrooms, screen and porch. Mm. So they came into the porch and to the left was my grandfather's room, so he knew he wasn't there, so the only place to go is to the right. Okay. And in that right room that's where I was. Mm. And it was so dark, it was like a dark as a thousand midnights. Mm, mm, mm. And they were coming toward the room walking and you just waiting, you don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah. Your imagination's running away with you. I would yes. And then they walk in with a gun in one hand and a flashlight in the other. And I the whole bed was shaking like mm. and I started praying. Yeah. And I say, God, if you let me get out of this, I'm gonna do right. It seemed like all the bad things you ever <laughs> did come up with you you're gonna die. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So uh they they stopped there and they looked at me and uh I'm waiting to be shot or whatever they're going to mm. do to me. It's an it's a awesome feeling. I, I would imagine. And, and they were large. This one got a head to pistol. He was a, a large figure, mm. about 6'4", 260 or something like that. Mm. And we're in bed. And so they passed on by. They didn't do anything to me. And they went to the next room where my cousin Curtis, the one that did the uh, interview on Eyes on the Prize. Yes. He was there. Uh, by this time, he made his uh, way to Greenwood to money. Uh, he was in bed with my uncle Robert, and mm. neither of them woke up. Mm. And it was good he didn't because Curtis was the type of guy. Uh, it would have been, it would would not have happened like it happened if Curtis had woke up. Wow. Yeah, that, he was that kind of person. Okay. And it probably been a lot of shooting and killing in the house. My goodness. Yeah, he was part, pretty outspoken. I think. Yes, and plus he, you know, he's a, he was the type of person. Even after that, he wanted to stay in his guns ready. Oh. And when he found out the one he had didn't even work. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so well, he's, he's all, he, he did the calling back to Chicago and everything. He's 18. Mm. And he became a uh, uh, police and he was Mayor Washington's bodyguard. No kidding. And, and before he died, passed away. So they went on to the next room uh, where they found uh, Emmett in the bed with my uncle Simmons. Okay. Simmons was 12 years old at the time. And uh, of course, they got Emmett up and told him to get dressed and told Simmons that he had to go to sleep. And, Grandmother went out the back door to try to get some help from the people next door, yeah. which were Caucasian people. Yeah. And uh, Emmett wanted to put on his shoes or socks, and he was saying, "Yeah, no." And they were very irate, and they were very vocal about it, you know. Mm. So eventually, they took him and they left with him. And uh, after they left, it was just so quiet. Nobody talked to anybody in the house. Nobody went to another room mm. to talk to anybody. My grandmother left. My grandfather left. He had to take her to her brother's house in Sumner, Mississippi. Yeah. So I got up and I said, they're probably coming back. So I got up and put my shoes on mm-hmm. because I said, they're coming back. And we were near the woods. I said, I'm heading for the woods. Yeah. I'm going to take off, you know. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. They're going <laughs> to get whatever, you. Yeah, whatever they're going to do, they're going to do to be there. Yeah. Because I just felt that they were going to do something. Oh, my Simmons, God. He didn't feel that way. He lived there. So when you live in a rough area, you don't have the same attitude that people Outside. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, they left with him, and that's the last time we saw him. You saw him. How many days went by before they actually found him? There was a uh, Sunday morning early. Uh, they found him that Wednesday. That Wednesday. And I left. I left that morning. Yeah. That next morning after the incident. No, I left that morning. Oh, that same morning. Yeah, I left the same morning. Of course, my uncle came over. He lived in money too. Uh, he's still living. He's ninety-five years old now. He got his pistol. Again, mm. it's more drum because I was kind of afraid of guns. Yeah. When you see guns in our house and man get his guns, there must be some more drama coming up, you know. Yes. And he was ready for whatever was going to happen. Wow. So he took me to my other uncle, who's now is 103, be 104 in April. And still alive. Yes. Sir. Yeah. And he he had his stuff. He kept he keep his stuff in the corner even now. <laughs> so uh, I was very I didn't sleep all night because my uncle they were playing with him said we're gonna send him out there to get you, you know. They mm. joking. They not they don't think anything was gonna happen to him. Mm. And so I didn't sleep. Yeah. I didn't sleep at all. Yeah. Uh, he took me and put me on the train. When when you came back, that that is a, a an amazing uh, account. When you came back to Chicago, did you follow the news report? Did you keep up with 
phone calls or whatever as to what was happening down the line with um, them finally finding him? Because if you were this disturbed before they found him, I imagine after you heard they had found him, that, that didn't let you sleep too good either, I imagine. Well, it's kind of a paradox. Uh, uh, I don't understand it, but I never had any sorrow or remorse about it. Mm. And I ask people to help me to understand that. And some said maybe you were in shock and God was just protect me, protecting me. Yeah. So I never had any ill will about it. Okay. Because deep down within, I said I'm going to see him again. All right. So if you say you're going to see someone again, you can't have these feelings. I understand. It would be contradictory. You know? Yes, yes. So um, we got the report and... I heard the report, yeah. but I still didn't accept it. Okay. Didn't, didn't accept it. And I yeah. saw one, uh, there's a man in town had a business. Mm -hmm. Looked just like a J.W. Mayer, the one that came in, had the pistol, the big guy. Yeah. And man, I saw him one day in my heart. Like, <laughs> stop. You know, this man, he's here. You know? <laughs> Thought he came to get you. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's here. So wow. there was a lot of fear, but yeah. no sorrow, remorse. And Did you go to the funeral? Went to the funeral, no, nothing, nothing like that. And now, I, I can't watch it now. I'm, I'm going to. I end up crying, you know, and that's that's 50 years later, though. Wow. Yeah, so. That, that's amazing. Yeah. I remember reading one report um, that at the time of the funeral, they gathered a lot of uh, money together because uh, of what Miss Till, who you actually allowed me to speak to her on the phone before she passed, and she um, told me some of her parts of the story as she understood it from the point that she heard about it. But um, I know one of the reports I read said that they gathered a lot of money in the city um, together for that time, uh, for the funeral, for the cause. Do you recall that happening? Uh, other people in the, in the city of Chicago kind of coming together, wanting to find out more and more about the story? I heard about money being raised, but I had no, I had no detail accounts of okay. where and what was done. You, you know, you're 16 and those things don't interest you. Exactly. Because there's nothing coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> not, not only because it's not coming yeah. your way, but you just have other interests in mind. Yes, I understand. Let's, let's look at this, because we know the court case um, uh, went on for a while. They were allowed off, even though later on, according to reports, there was a story told uh, admitting to uh, this crime being committed and, and young Emmett being killed. Uh, recently, in recent years, I know they exhumed the body again. What was your involvement with that? Because I hear that you uh, were over one of the um, services again. What was your involvement with that when they brought the body back up? Did you think it was actually going to be Emmett, or did you think it might be somebody else? I had no problem with it. Some of the family members were reluctant to uh, have it exhumed because they thought, what if it's not him? Okay. But I had no doubt that it was him. Mm -hmm. And uh, they needed to do this because the trial, during the trial, they said that this was not Emmett. It was a body of old man. Mm. So it had never been proven that this actually was Emmett. Mm. Defense used that, and that's how they won. Mm. It's not Emmett. Emmett is somewhere in Detroit. Amen. And, and that uh, mm. his mother and father, they're just trying to embarrass Mississippi. Mm. So they needed to exhume the body, and they did a DNA mm -hmm. to prove that it was him. So it definitely was him. And when we recommit his, recommitted his body, mm -hmm. I did the eulogy, and I told him that Emmett speaks louder in death than if he had lived. Wow. That was beautiful. Here's something that I'm curious about that I'd like our, our viewers to kind of get a sense of. Uh, oftentimes, especially during certain times of the year, um, oftentimes we go back into history as we remember those who, who came before us, and we talk about various events that have happened. Uh, some do it just for the sake of hearing a good story. Mm -hmm. um, some do it uh, for the sensationalism of it all. What is your purpose behind sharing? Because I know you travel throughout the nation um, talking at various colleges, universities, schools, and, and small groups about this. And I'm, I'm very honored that you've um, chosen to share this story this time with the rest of the world. What is your idea or hopes for those who hear the story will do now? Well, I, I approach different groups in different ways. Okay. As African American um, of people, I try to tell them, need to know your history. Mm -hmm. There's so much. I'm learning all the time. They've been running a special on Percy Julian. I just mm -hmm. learned about him. And I, we just need to know our history. No one put it out there. Who's going to tell the story? Right. The mass media is not going to do it and seem like we don't have the funds to do it. The Jewish people will not let you forget the Holocaust. That's true. We're going to know about That's that true. history. So we need, and sometimes when you know your history and understand what we've done, what we've contributed, mm -hmm. you feel better about yourself. 
That is true. And I approach uh, some of the uh, other schools, uh, and I try to tell them that the only way difference is going to be made is going to be made with people that's in power. Mm. Anytime African American made progress, there was always some whites that were there to further the cause. Okay. Abolitionists, the NAACP, mm-hmm. look at President Johnson, they were there. So I said, you guys are going to be the one that's in power, in position. You can make the difference. Mm. You have to stand up and do what's right when it comes down. You're not going to be popular. One guy said, but I'm going to do what's right. Mm-hmm. I said, you're not going to be liked. That's right. You have to do it. So we need to remember, history is an intricate part of uh, America. It is. And we have world history. Mm-hmm. We have uh, state history. And we have the uh, country history. So that's an intricate part of that has been left out. Mm-hmm. Even the whites do not know the history. Of right. The right. They just have been taught a perception. That's right. And we were lazy, shiftless. Right. And when you tried to... Uh, they need to know the thing that we invented, contributed to make America what it is. That's right. Besides the backbreaking work. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, that that education is so important. Being able to have knowledge. One of the things that I I, I talk about is that um, education is not power in and of itself. It's what you do with that education. What you do with that knowledge once you have it. And that's why it was so critical for me to find out what your vision was. Um, um, in talking about the story and those incidents and, and things like that, just what your vision is with that. Uh, you have been very enlightening for us. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and share this with us. I know this this very subject alone, uh, uh, along with all the other subjects you could just talk all day long about, but it is so good to, to hear some of the truth from someone who was actually there as a part of it. So I want to thank you again for being with us on the show. Appreciate that very much.